Good morning. It's good to see you. How many woke up today with the thought this is the day the Lord has made? Well, we're glad you came anyway. <laughs> this is God's day, and every day is God's day. But we've set this one aside together and worship together, and we're glad that you're here. And uh, we want to move right into our service. I have a couple of announcements we need to make. Uh, tonight, there, we, we're in lieu of our Sunday night service, we're having Pastor Appreciation Night. And so uh, we want you to bring some finger foods and uh, come. We'll have a good time together. There'll be some kind of a program around that. Uh, uh, if you are planning to donate for the Relay for Life, we need to, you need to see Samantha. She, where is Samantha? Are you here? I'm sorry. Okay. But anyway, talk to her. She needs to talk to you if you're planning to donate for Relay for Life. And Charlene has uh, something to share with us here. <laughs> I just wanted to uh, mention that we're starting on Wednesday evening a new Beth uh, Moore Bible study. It's the newest one of hers called Sacred Se Sacred secrets it's a little hard to say um but it's i believe it's going to be very very good um we'll start at seven i think the videos are a little shorter now so you with um kids that the program starts at seven maybe that will make it easier for you uh the books that are here the the church is buying the cds and things but the books are 9.95 for each individual they look like this and um, if you'd be interested, we're going to start on the 13th. I know there's a few that have already said that they're going to be a part of it. Usually it's eight to 10 women. We've got room for more. We'd love to have you. And uh, we're going to shoot from seven for it to be seven to eight o'clock. So we run with a teen program, run with a children's program so that um, there's not a conflict in time. So see me if you'd like me to pick up a book. I have a few extra right now, but we're going to wait till after revival. So it will start on November 13th, as far as we know. Also, if there'd be anyone that would be interested in starting a, a Bible study with this curriculum, um, we would have it here at the church. There's really no studying for it as far as the leader. So if you would be interested in starting one on a maybe a Tuesday night or something, and you can't, maybe you teach on Wednesday night, something like that, uh, we'd love for you to do that. You might just get with me, and we could maybe even start up another one. So thank you. All right. Uh, just a reminder, next week you need to set your clocks back one hour, and we start revival uh, with Brother Jim Chapman, and that will run through uh, the following Wednesday. Pray a lot this week for revival. Plan to be here every service that you can, and let's just trust God for a great revival meeting. I have a couple of names to add to our prayer list this morning. Uh, John Kelly. Uh, I lost his wife recently and uh, is in need of prayer. Put John Kelly, if you would, on your prayer list. And then Sherry Klein is going to be having surgery uh, soon on her elbow, I believe she told me. And uh, put Sherry on your prayer list, if you would, and keep her in your prayers. Would you stand together as we look to the Lord in prayer this morning? Father, we bow before you this morning, grateful in our hearts for the privilege we have of coming before you, uh, gathering here in your name today to worship you. And Father, coming in even to the throne of grace, what a, what a joy, what a privilege that God, Almighty God, would let us come. And we know that's because of the death of Jesus Christ. The veil of the temple was rent in twain, and we have access to the throne of God today because of his great mercy. So, Father, we come. And we pray, dear God, that you will reach out and touch every need that is represented here today. These on our prayer list this morning, Lord, these names that we've called out before you, we pray, God, that you will touch them and uh, grant their needs according to your will and your purpose for their lives today, we pray. Father, we have gathered here to worship you today, so bless us as we uh, approach you through our worship, through our praise and we just pray, God, that you will bless our praise team this morning. Anoint them, use them to stir our hearts and draw us closer to you, we pray. Blessing our offering that we're about to receive. 
Bless Brother Dennis today, Lord, as he breaks the bread of life. We'll praise you, Lord, for all that you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our loving Father, we know you are here. We bring you our worries and all of our fears. We bring you the problems that we cannot solve. We know you are faithful. We know you are strong. What a working God. Open the heavens. You can make a way where there is no way. What a working God. You can move mountains. You can
Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion, my constant friend is He. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know He watches me. I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Let not your heart be troubled. His tender words I hear. Resting on his goodness, I lose my doubt and fear. Though by the path he leadeth, but one step I may see. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And I know he watches me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. For his eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches me. I am tempted Whenever clouds arise When songs give place to sighing When hope within me dies I draw the closer to Him From care He sets me free Because 
before I sing because I get up here and get really nervous. But when June um, asked me to sing last week, this song has just run through my head all week. I think part of it is we have family in, and this was a song my grandma always wanted to hear me sing. And also because God's been working on me, and I know that I don't, I'm not totally where, I, where this song um, would say that you would be, but it is my desire to draw closer to God every day.
Trust that's your prayer this morning. I have a thank you card here. Church family, thank you for all the visits and prayers during my surgery and recuperation. I appreciate everyone. Love to you all. Tanya Lewis, and we're so glad that she's able to be here this morning following her surgery. All right, uh, if you'd like to follow along, we're in the book of Nehemiah, of course. We're in our Engage the Word series, and we are studying the book of Nehemiah. Hopefully you'll look on the inside of your bulletin. You'll find uh, something that says DCPI training in Carthage. Now that it has to do with church planting. And you don't have to be a pastor if you are a layman that thinks at some point in time you might be interested in helping with a church plant somewhere. Uh, that training is for you. They tell me it's very excellent. Our new district superintendent, Mark Bain, is, uh, is uh, really encouraging us to plant churches because new churches grow faster and uh, there are more converts uh, per capita in new churches than there are established churches. So you might want to check that out. So far in our Engage the Word messages, we've examined the topics of vision, discouragement, and prayer. There was a phrase in last uh, week's message that... Uh, I've thought a lot about this week. It came to me early in the week, and I I've, and I've, haven't been able to get it out of my mind. It simply said they were living in ruins, and they accepted it. They were living in ruins, and they accepted it. If you'll recall, uh, the city had been destroyed. The temple had been destroyed. The walls had been destroyed. They were able to uh, rebuild the temple, but for some 90 years, that temple had been... Uh, unprotected and in those days it was very important that you have walls around your city because uh, marauders and thieves would come and pillage and plunder and for some reason in a 90 year span no one had been able to muster the motivation to rebuild those walls they were living in ruins and they accepted it Today I'd like to talk about refusing to accept the unacceptable. Refusing to accept the unacceptable. And again, I'm going to read the first uh, four verses. I am keeping up with my reading, by the way, but I just can't seem to get out of chapter 1. 
So, uh, we'll read the first four verses. The words of Nehemiah, <clears throat> son of Hakaliah, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa. Remember, Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king. He had a, well, he had it made. He lived in the palace. Everything was at his disposable, he, at disposal. He had prestige, status, position. He had what everyone wanted. And uh, Han and I, one of the brothers, came from Judah with some other men, and I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. I think it's significant that uh, Nehemiah cared. I mean, he had it made. Why would he worry about uh, people back in the homeland? But he did. The news wasn't good. They said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. And listen to what Nehemiah did. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Well, that was a pretty good first step right there. That tells us a little bit about Nehemiah and his character, the kind of person that he was. He questioned Hanani, who had just returned. He questioned them about the Jews who had survived the exile, and the news was not good. Verse 3 tells us they were in great trouble and disgrace, and the wall of Jerusalem was broken down, and its gates had been burned with fire. As he listened, he could barely stand it. God's people were in ruin and reproach, and he was broken over the situation. And the apparent complacency of the people of Jerusalem. And that's what I want to focus on today. He'd never even been to Jerusalem. He had grown up in Babylon, in captivity. Never even been there. And he was more concerned than they were. It appeared that they were not concerned, at least. At least not enough to do anything about the situation. He lived in comfort in the palace, yet he wept, mourned, fasted, and prayed over the condition of Jerusalem. We need more people like that. We need intercessors. We need people that are willing to stand in the gap on behalf of someone else. He was that kind of person. The people of Judah were living right in the middle of the rubble, and evidently they'd found some way to accept it. They had come to terms with it, evidently. It had been unprotected for 90 years. It had sat there for 90 years. They had gotten used to it. To them, it was the new normal. They were willing to walk around the devastation instead of being concerned enough to do something about it. They were living in ruins, and they accepted it. When we're confronted with an unacceptable situation... We must respond in some way. We must do something about it or somehow learn to tolerate it. If we choose to tolerate it, we must somehow desensitize ourselves to it. We can't just go on and on feeling the pain of this situation. We've got to somehow numb ourselves to that situation. We try to ignore it. We try to justify it. We try to rationalize it. We try to minimize it. We numb ourselves by becoming apathetic, indifferent, complacent. Of course, there are some people that numb themselves in other ways. Apathy is a coping mechanism that some people use. Now, the ostrich is famous for sticking his head in the sand. We find other ways. Apathy is one of those ways. Of course, you heard about the, the fellow who was asked what was worse, ignorance or apathy? He said, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> Sounds like he had them both. I heard they started an apathy club on campus, scheduled their first meeting, and no one cared enough to show up. Of course, that's better than the procrastinators. They never even got around to scheduling a meeting. Those are ways we laugh about apathy, we laugh about procrastinating, but really they're symptoms of a deeper problem. 
They're symptoms of a person who's unwilling to confront the situation. So they, they put it off or they numb themselves to it like the people in Jerusalem. How were the Jews able to come to terms with a seemingly intolerable situation? What was the mind process? How did they arrive at the point that this beautiful temple that they had spent so much time restoring and rebuilding was okay at the mercy of thieves and marauders? What did they tell themselves that made that all right? Well, if you'll permit me to use a rather earthy illustration this morning. I used to clean out a lot of chicken houses and barns when I was young, working my way through school. There they are, only ours weren't that kind. In those days, we used a wheelbarrow and a shovel. People often ask, how do you stand that smell? In fact, if I, if I was driving by a field where litter had been spread, I would ask myself, how do I stand that smell? <laughs> but the funny thing is, after you're there for a while, you don't notice it. You, you become desensitized to it. Can you believe that? It happens. In fact, I was able to sit right down and eat my lunch right there in the chicken house. The point is, God has given us an amazing ability to adapt. We have an ability to tune out things we don't want to experience. You know, has anyone lived by a train track? People tell me that you just get to where you don't even notice it. How do you not notice a train? I that's just the way we are. God has given us that ability to tune out unpleasant situations. We used to have a clock in our living room. And people would come and that clock would just drive them crazy. It ticked really, really loud. And in fact, if we had a tape recorder going or something like that, I could hear it as plain as day. But somehow I had learned to tune it out. Now that ability to adapt can be a good thing or it can be a bad thing. The problem comes when we adapt to things that we shouldn't tolerate. We get used to things we shouldn't get used to. Now, you've probably all heard the illustration of the frog in the boiling water. Well, you'll be happy to know I've never tried it myself, but I'm just taking the word of uh, many, many people who have used this illustration for years, and they tell me if you turn that temperature up gradually enough, the frog, being a cold-blooded creature will stay there until he boils to death. When he could very easily just hop out of the pan. If it happens gradually enough, we can adapt to almost anything. People ask me a lot if things have changed in my 36 years of teaching. Are kids different than they used to be? And my reply is usually, well, it's happened so gradually I just really haven't even noticed I used to notice purple hair. <laughs> now it's just commonplace. We have an amazing ability to adapt. I've heard people say, well, I'm, I'm used to profanity. I'm around it all the time. It doesn't shock me anymore. Should you really ever get used to someone using God's name in vain? Do you want to get used to that? If you repeatedly expose yourself to sexually explicit music videos, movies, etc., you'll desensitize yourself to things that are immoral. Everything that enters the mind through the senses affects us to some degree. And someone said that Americans have lost their ability to blush. So that's a situation of our adaptability being a bad thing. Do you think it's an accident that the entertainment industry gradually stretches the limits of what most Americans would consider appropriate and acceptable? Always pushing the envelope? Do you think that's an accident? Think of the family TV shows of 40 or 50 years ago. Those, of course, who are old enough or have Nickelodeon or TV land. 
Ozzie and Harriet. Does anyone remember Ozzie and Harriet? Reruns of Ozzie and Harriet? <laughs> Leave it to Beaver. The Cleavers. Ward, June, Wally, Theodore. Father knows best. That, way, that goes way back there. Nowadays, it would be called Father Knows Nothing, Kids Know Best. <laughs> now, contrast those shows with the shows of today. Now, I have not watched these programs, but I've seen enough on commercials that probably tell me that they probably don't promote biblical values. The Simpsons, Family Guy, Modern Family, Two and a Half Men, I've never watched them, but I'm thinking just from the commercials that probably not biblical values. Am I right there? Nobody's going to admit. <laughs> when was the last time you saw a TV show that centered around a traditional, functional, biblical family? Besides Duck Dynasty, I mean. <laughs> What's my point? I haven't watched a sitcom in years, but... Not too long ago, a few days ago, there was a piece of one on the end of something I DVR'd, and wow, <laughs> was I ever shocked. We've come a long way, and it's come so gradually that we lose our shock value. We don't drop our jaws and bug our eyes out anymore because we're used to it. We be, we've become desensitized. Now the question is, are there areas in your personal life that are unacceptable, but you've learned to live with them? How about your relationship with God, your spouse, your family? How about your habits, your priorities? Have you learned to tolerate situations that really stink, but you hardly even notice the smell anymore? Have they become your new normal? How about your church, your community, your nation? Although there are still many things that are great about our nation, and believe it or not, there are a few things that are even better than they used to be. In my opinion, there are many ways in which America is the frog in the boiling water. Amos 6.1 says, Woe to you who are complacent or at ease in Zion. Woe. When you see that word, woe, you need to woe. What's that mean? Grief, sorrow, affliction. A miserable or sorrowful state. Woe to you who are complacent or at ease in Zion. Those words sound strange and contrary today. We would probably say happy are those who are at ease. I mean, that's what we're all after, right? The good life. A life of ease. Good times. After all, you only live once. Might as well reach for the gusto. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you might die. Isn't that the American way? Ease. Comfort. The Bible says, woe to you. Against such people, woe is pronounced. Ephesians 5, 14 through 16 says, Wake up, O sleeper. Rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live. Not as unwise, but as wise making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. I think it's time to wake up. Now, my alarm went off at 5 this morning, and, well, I did what any self-respecting pastor would do. I hit the snooze. <laughs> but, you know, there comes a time, it's time to quit hitting the snooze. It's time to wake up. It's time we got serious about following Jesus. As with Nehemiah and the walls, no significant improvement will occur until we care enough to weep over the ruins. I didn't say worry. I didn't say gripe and complain. We've got plenty of those. I said weep. No significant change will happen until we are concerned enough to do something about our situation. Are you tired of stepping around the rubble of a broken life? Anybody ever watch Hoarders on TV? Nobody? 
So a few people. How do they ever get okay with that? There's, no, there's not even a path left. They're climbing over the top of that. And somehow, in their mind, that's okay. Are you ready to let God do some rearranging, rebuilding, and restoring? Well, concern is the first step. Nehemiah had it, and it's time we had it. True concern will compel you to do something. You can't help it. If you've got true concern, you've got to do something about it. What did Nehemiah's concern cause him to do? Verse 4, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. I don't know of a better start than that. Right there. He wept, he mourned, he fasted, he prayed for a period of about four months. By the end of his prayer time, he knew exactly what he had to do. He didn't just start off somewhere and ask God to bless him. He tarried before the Lord until he got a direction. He knew exactly what to do. And when God's people pray, difficult decisions fall into proper perspective and appropriate actions follow. The church in America has been referred to as a sleeping giant. I think it's time the giant woke up. I think it's time we quit snoring. I think it's time we quit accepting the unacceptable and tolerating the intolerable. It's time to wake up. Proverbs 6, 9 asks this question. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? I think the time is now. I think it's time we stop walking around the rubble. I think it's time we stop tolerating the intolerable and accepting the unacceptable. I told you last week about the white plastic lawn chair that someone mowed around. I'm just driving down the road and I, I look and I said, did I just see that? This person had mowed around a white plastic lawn chair. All they would have had to do is, they wouldn't even have to got, got off the lawn mower. They could have just picked it up and set it over on the other side. But somehow that was okay. We have a tendency to take the way of least resistance, don't we? We have a tendency to do what's easy in the short term. It's time we started thinking long term. Next Sunday at 10.30 a.m. we'll begin a series of services that we call Revival. We called an evangelist named Jim Chapman of Big Chap Ministries. How many have ever heard Jim speak? How many think he's a great speaker? You're in for a treat. Why do we still have revival meetings? When some, I tell some preacher we're having revival, some preachers, they say, oh, you guys still have revival. Well, isn't that nice? Like that's some kind of a thing from a bygone era. We don't have revivals anymore. Well, Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 16, says it was He, Christ, who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists. I don't think he would call evangelists if he didn't mean for us to use them. Some to be pastors and teachers to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into Him who is the head, that is, Christ. From Him the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. So evangelists, you see, have a special calling. Preparing God's people for works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up. That's why we still call evangelists. You need to hear more than pastors and teachers. You need to hear more than what I have to say. 
or what your Sunday school teacher has to say. You and I need the ministry of an evangelist. We have two revivals per year, 10 services. That's not very many. That's why you need to be at every service. You and I need to take advantage of this opportunity to be revived, to be stirred out of our comfort zone, to be inspired to do something about the conditions where we live. Probably the most famous revival passage ever is 2 Chronicles 7.14. If my people, that's us, who are called by my name, that's us, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. That's the problem today. Too many people who are called by His name don't care enough to humble themselves and pray and seek His face and turn from their wicked ways. We say we care, but often our actions say something else. It seems like it's more about our agenda than His. It's more about our schedule than His. So let's take a lesson from Nehemiah. Let's be concerned enough to humble ourselves and pray and seek His face and turn from our wicked ways. Then, like Nehemiah, let's be obedient to the Lord's leading. Let's let God use us to reclaim, renew, and rebuild the broken down walls of our lives and the lives around us. We're going to close this morning by a hymn. It's, it's not a real familiar hymn. It's number two, 627 in your hymnals if you'd like to turn simply says if my people and it comes from this passage in second chronicles if my people will humble themselves and pray would you stand with me please As always, the altars are open. If anyone would feel the need to pray this morning, we would invite you to do so. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, shall humble themselves and pray. If my people, which are called by my name, shall seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then And that's a promise. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for this promise from your word. We pray, Lord, that you would forgive us when we get distracted, when we become all about the trivial and leave the important undone. We just pray, Lord, that you would make it clear to us how we fit into your plan for our home, our church, our community, and help us, Lord, to get with that plan so that we might be instruments in your hands to bring revival to our land. We thank you, Lord, for these that are here today. We pray your blessing on them as they go from this place. We'll give you the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You are dismissed.